Welcome to the fourth episode of Off the Hill, where we catch up on the latest and greatest of the federal election campaign. I'm joined this week by my colleagues Ryan Goss, constitutional law expert, and Andrew Hughes, a political marketing expert. If you've missed any of our previous episodes or any of the vote election forums on Tuesday nights, jump online at anu.edu.au forward slash news to catch up. Now, a couple of things have surprised me this week. I was watching the news and I was wondering how can the ATO make this announcement about uh, about reviewing the, the MPs allowances and then how can the government make this this dairy package announcement? We're supposed to be in caretaker convention. What's going on, Ryan? Yeah, well, Jill, we operate under our constitutional system under a system of what we call responsible government. And yep. that means that our ministers are responsible, accountable to the parliament. But that process doesn't work when parliament's not sitting, when parliament's not in session. Yep. So over the years, we've got these caretaker conventions that we've evolved. And basically they say from the time the election is called until the time we have a new government, ministers shouldn't be making major policy changes or major policy decisions. They're not law, they're just rules. Yep. Um, and so uh, when you have a situation like this week where we had Barnaby Joyce announcing a package for dairy farmers, he consulted with his opposite number, which is what the rules require him to do. He contacted Joel Fitzgibbon, he said, oh, we're doing something about dairy. Um, <laughs> and Fitzgibbon agreed, as he's required to do. But the question mm. is, these aren't laws, these are just rules. And so there's a lot of wiggle room there, and Labor certainly thinks that Barnaby Joyce has taken advantage of that wiggle room in the caretaker conventions. Yep. Okay, so why would the ALP agree to this? You, you know, you're the opposition in an election campaign, the government comes to you, they say, we're going to splash some cash around and the opposition says, yep, go for it. Why, why do that? Look, I think messaging wise, it sounds good. It sounds as though, you know, as an opposition, you can't oppose everything all of the time. Now, not to mention too, they want to sound business friendly and they haven't sounded business friendly so far in this campaign. Um, and that's really important, you know, stakeholder group to win over in any election in this country are the business groups, small, medium and large. And Labor have not done much of a job at doing that at the moment. So maybe this is an olive branch out to the industry groups as well, saying, look, we're understanding where you're coming from. We're understanding the economic situation, but also we're understanding that you may have some unique cases in the years ahead, which we want to help out with. So this could be the start of one of them. That's very generous, Andrew. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit more sceptical. I think where does the money end, right? You know, exactly. This yeah. week it's dairy farmers. Who next? Yeah, look, and this is one of the issues too, which governments in the past have had. Let's not forget Tony Abbott's decision to support SPC in Shepparton. Yep. Got a lot of backlash within his own cabinet because of the reason this is seen as being against uh, free trade and protectionism in a way as well, because under the... Uh, what liberals really believe deep down yep. is that free trade is everything. We don't protect anyone. What comes is what happens. Yep. So, And we just yeah. have this uncertainty as to what to expect from this government. That's they right. won't support cars. They will support submarines. They will support dairy farmers. I mean, supporting these industries may well be the, the, a good thing for those industries, a good thing to do, but it's really unclear to, to be able to predict. And remember too, their message is certainty. Yeah, so that's right. So how can you say, again, get back to the core message they talked about at the budget, certainty in how we govern. You don't have that if they're going to, you know, flip and flop between industry groups We've all the time. We've seen very little certainty this week. Black holes. What do we make of this? Well, we've seen, haven't we? I think mm -hmm. we've seen the government and the opposition um, trying to put their black holes up against each other and measure them and argue over whose black hole is greater and whose black hole is deeper and all these sorts of arguments we've seen this week. I think it's a real shame. I find it very frustrating that the arguments are about essentially accounting problems. Now, absolutely promises need to be paid for one way or the other, but the, what we're having here are not arguments over big picture stuff. They're arguments that are about exactly precisely how we add up some sums. And surely that's what we have the Charter of Budget Honesty and the Parliamentary Budget Office that we've implemented over the last couple of decades to try and break Australian e elections mm. yep. out of this cycle where it's just a debate about maths, essentially, rather than a debate about we've the big picture. We've solved this challenge many times, and, and yet we're still talking that's about right. it, right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it gets back to the fact maybe in an election campaign this long, we have the chance to go into these policies in more details and depth than a normal four or five week campaign. But now we're seeing policy black holes emerge. I mean, our boss, the, you know, upstairs, he's very good at understanding about black holes in space, but we have policy black holes emerging all over the place and, and different parties are walking straight into them. And you think we need the time now in this campaign to go over some of these issues. And some of my colleagues in my yep. college where I come from really concerned about this lack of depth going into some of these policy announcements 
They can drop four or five million dollars in one day and yet there's little detail about how it's going to be spent or how it's going to act, be enacted in practice. The it's causing concern. Right? Yeah, the exactly economists. right. Yeah, and I think people in business in general because they want certainty and that's why half the message from the budget night was about certainty. It was again speaking to the business groups out there saying, look, you're sick and tired of uncertainty in Australian politics, we'll give it back to you. Mm. And certainty is a strong message. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's a strong message for everyone. But in particular, business groups are screaming for certainty out there from politicians. They want to know what's going to happen in the next three to five years so they can plan for it. Now, the problem is, of course, that voters aren't that worried about certainty. <clears throat> yeah. What I've found lately is we've done a lot of polls on this, right? We commonly yep. ask, would you prefer tax cuts or would you prefer more, more spending on social services? And what I've noticed just since the last uh, the last change of government, 2013, is that this is tracking who's in government, Yeah. right? So yeah. ALP governments are, are in power, and all of a sudden voters want tax cuts. Yeah. Coalition governments come to power, and we go, oh, I feel like we've had enough tax cuts. What yeah. we need now is more spending. So there's there are very, very strong, uh, I guess, uh, incentives at play that don't always work nicely together. You know, business yeah. groups want one yep. thing, voters want another. And I think we saw that played again on budget night too and, and in that whole week <laughs> where Bill Shorten pitched that message about social investment and social capital and Malcolm Turnbull was the other side of the coin on financial capital and economic investment. And it really you know, highlights how we see each party in this election campaign. And Andrew, I think one of the great shames of this election campaign is that we could have had both parties, given the context, given the budget, we could have had mm. both parties set up a full suite of policies yep. at the start of the campaign, just like they do in the UK, just like they do in many other countries, and then campaign on that basis. There yeah. is no reason Australia needs to get stuck in this cycle of day-to-day -day announcements every day. Yeah. It's not how elections work in other places. Mm. There's no need for them to work here, and we're just stuck in this death cycle of one announcement after another and well, debates over maths. In mm. those countries, they have campaign manifestos. Right. That are yeah, comprehensive exactly. documents, yeah. and we don't really have them here. What a cool What's name, Manifesto. Manifesto is <laughs> a great name, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, now, what I really want to talk about is some of the stuff because that we're not talking about anything other than jobs and growth yeah. and maybe Medicare and a few slip ups. Yeah. What are some of the things that, that you think are sort of sleeper issues? And I know we've talked about one uh, in advance of today that Ryan, do you want to introduce? Yeah, well, I think we've seen this week. Um, led by Four Corners, but also more generally mm. debate over the role of political donations yep. in Australia and whether or not there is room for change in the way that political donations work in Australia, whether we need more transparency, more accountability. Looking at this as a, as a constitutional lawyer who spends time thinking about the constitution, I think one of the great things about Australia is that we can take steps to make political donations more transparent, more accountable. Our constitution and our High Court allows us to do that. And that's great compared to, for example, the United States, where under the US understanding of free speech, speech is money, as they say, and mm. so you can't regulate that spending of the money anywhere near the way that we can in Australia. So I think one of the great things, the foundations of our constitution is that we can do that. The question is, um, will there be sufficient demand for that? Now, you think there should be demand? Yeah, there should be, because when I mean, you think about the role of stakeholders in politics, it's increasing every single year in terms of concern by most ordinary voters out there, because they're thinking, well, they hear these stories about Okay, let's go back to the industry group example we talked about just before. Why does one industry group get more, you know, more deals than another group out there? People might say, well, the farmers, hang on, they're the National Party. The Nats have a lot of power in Parliament. Mm. For a small, minor party, they're the most powerful party we have of their size in Australia. And they have a lot of weight to bring. And people start thinking, where's this connection? Same with Labor. If you say Labor to people, what, what's the first thing they think about in their head? Unions. In terms of connect? Brilliant. Coalition? business and government. Yep. And so people suddenly get concerned over how this could be affecting their long-term opportunities as people in society. And why not? Because if you think about it, you know, you don't have much money to give. Um, Bernie Sanders' campaign in the US is a prime example of running on small donations, yep. hardly any big stakeholders involved, and hence why it's got a really big viral feel to it, a real buzz to it in a way. Um, and transparency and accountability are the key here, aren't they? Yeah, exactly right. Because how do we know someone out there isn't making a policy up because they've been paid to basically or been supported by a huge donation to their party. We don't. We're never going to know everything though. I oh, think we need on. to have some trust. We need to oh, have we more do. faith. But, yeah, We're oh, doing a lot on. better than America. Compulsory voting, you know, really I'm dampens more the... You are much more cynical on this than I am. <laughs> we, I can, think, we can do better. I think, we can do I think better. we're going okay. I'm, I'm very sanguine about this. I'll sleep very well tonight. Final thoughts for the week. 
I'll let Ryan go first. Oh, well, it's, um, it's State of Origin Week, of course, in the in the Eastern States, and we've got two Queenslanders on that panel, so on this panel, so we're very excited. Um, I think, given the overlap between the State of Origin and the election, it's worth noting for the I think for the first time in history we have a Senate ticket at this election that has a veteran of the New South Wales team and a veteran of the Queensland team running together. That's the Glenn Lazarus ticket in Queensland. It's a reminder, Jill, that the things that unite us are greater than the things that divide us. That's beautiful, Ryan. Andrew? My final thought for the week, on the Save Origin thing, go Queensland, but also um, let's not forget the role of the Senate as a state's house is becoming more noticeable again, I think, this election because of um, Nick Xenophon, Glenn Lazarus in Queensland, Jackie Lambie in Tasmania, all of a sudden we start hearing a lot more talk about states issues mm. at a national level. And I think it's one of those bubbler sleeper issues on the side there, but yet I think it'll have an important role in the Senate and how it's decided. You might be right, the return to Haradine type days. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, I mean, really Brian Haradine, I mean, he's, he's from the far right, but yet at the same time, known as a big statesman. And a Labor man originally. Yeah, very true. Uh, my, my thought from this week is really the, the Nova Paris decision is, I think, opening up a whole can of worms about what it means to be a parliamentarian. Um, you know, it can be really frustrating. And I think a lot of these candidates running at the moment might be looking at her decision and thinking, ooh, mm. what have we got ourselves in for? Good point. We'll see how these play out. And until next week, enjoy the campaign.